Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. How are you? Are you looking forward to the holidays? <laughs> huh? Oh, boy. <laughs> nah. Mm. Hey, what an exciting show we have for you today. And by that, of course, I mean Sam Levine is here, everybody. <laughs> Sammy. Uh, Sam, you just saw the... Oh, uh, thank you. Oh, it's thank a slow start. Mostly standing ovation. Uh, you saw the Nightcrawler last night. I did see Nightcrawler. I just read in the trades that you yeah. saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, and what did you think? I thought it was ph phenomenal. Uh, uh, Hall was creepily fantastic. Wasn't he, though? And, yeah, and the, the action, the tension was uh, tremendous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was excited to see one of my favorite Mad Men actors in it, Kevin Ram, who plays Ted Shaw on, uh, on Mad Men. Yes. On Mad Men. That's right. <laughs> yeah. He was terrific playing yeah. um, frustrated. Yes. <laughs> And, and playing basically what he plays on Mad Men. And Renee Russo for the win, by the way. Yes. yes. She's great in it. Yeah, and yeah. I love the um, Siamese fighting fish work on the eyelids, makeup wise. Yep. Um, but I think because of the weight loss and the performance, he's going to get nominated. I think you it's got to be very high in the weight loss. That's what they're saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is you know that he, it's a nominated, a nominatable role for him. But uh, Independent Spirit Awards slam dunk. But yeah, I mean he's the kind of guy though who like every other movie he does though he's Looks always different. swinging for the fences with the with the characters. It's, you see, that's the handsome thing that holds him back from being considered a brilliant, ridiculously talented actor yeah. because that's what he is. But he's got that damn handsome thing <laughs> happening. You know, okay. our guest and I met. Jill and Hall when he was but a teen, but a teen, but a teen. Well, once we introduce the guest, perhaps we'll, we'll I know I'm that saying up. I feel bad we're leaving him out. I will bet he's got great stuff to add on this. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to need you to bring that back into the circle. I, I gladly will. Jamie, how's things over there? Things are great. Yeah. Other than I think I desperately need a new MacBook. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody out there is watching or listening and you like to send donate. Jamie a new MacBook, <laughs> go into your parents' wallets and purses, <laughs> grab a dollar bill, send it to Jamie Fox, care of. West Side Comedy Theater in Santa Monica, California. That's where we're coming to you live from, the West Side Comedy Theater. Uh, we don't have a two-shot today, so you can't see it. But uh, that's only because a piece of equipment told us to go fuck ourselves. Uh, we are, in fact, at the West Side Comedy Theater. If you're ever in the Los Angeles area, uh, do and yourself a And you solid. find yourself wandering through the Croc store. And you find yourself wandering on the Third Street Promenade. Go right around the corner of the alleyway between Third and Fourth. It's true. And stumble on in. Uh, it really is a great space. There's great uh, improv theaters all over town. This happens to be one of the best. Um, and we're super thrilled about our new home here. Um, and also, uh, write to us at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com and let us know how you do the show. Do you listen? Do you watch? Do you take it with you on a long trip or to the gym? We like hearing from you. Contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. Um, anything else to report? Oh, uh, I'd like to say thank you, uh, to all of the C minus students in this great country of ours who've once again insisted on making the uh, historically talentless Kim Kardashian uh, trending. <laughs> um, and thank you, Kim, for reminding us that indeed it is your giant oiled ass that people really <laughs> care about. Um, what the fuck? Is it, is it the beginning of the end? Is it? Just a continuing reminder. No, we're, that we're in the middle of the end. The beginning <laughs> was some years ago. <laughs> it's truly astonishing. I like to taunt Kevin with the photos. I yeah. like to like. Have you come seen up this? Have you seen this? Have you seen I'd this? like to come up behind him yeah. and just scare him. Uh, I mean, it's a great <laughs> reminder that this wildly famous person was, in fact, uh, initially famous for a amateur porno, uh, <laughs> and her ability to fillet in specifics was uh, was all the rage, and now had a baby, cranked one of those out nicely, and then what better way to celebrate uh, the child's future <laughs> than to remind everyone that she has a big oiled ass. Sammy, over to you. You know, Kevin, <laughs> I'm so glad you came to me on this topic. Um, here's the thing. Yeah. What is the thing? You know when you're at the supermarket yep. and, uh, and you're standing there in the checkout, sure. and, then the, uh, and then the guy behind the checkout goes, I know you, you're, you're a celebrity, right? And you always go, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. When they say that to me, I always go, no, no, I'm an actor. Kim Kardashian is a celebrity. There you go. She's replaced. Famous the just for being famous. Right. Uh, I'm an actor, but nice to meet you. Have a nice day. That's a, that's so a great. We and, have then, to, and then they walk away going, what an asshole. Yeah, we, have to have, <laughs> we have to have the Kardashians <laughs> and the Hiltons. It's the new celebrity. It, we have to have actual celebrities. I actually kind of defend, so I defend Paris. Jamie likes to defend Paris Hilton because she, she, 
She did the fillet right. and went the straight and narrow. She right. did, and, she and now she's just like a smart business woman. Like she doesn't well, come back. Well, if I may then, doesn't Kim Kardashian have some app? She becomes yeah. wildly more wealthy with the business acumen. I'm sure she's surrounded by Jews yeah. who are telling her how to do the business. Um, the Paris Hilton seems to actually be at the forefront of most of. Yeah, her. she's always. I mean, because remember, we used to. I used to. I used to have to read her tweets all the yeah. time, and it was like she was always. You know, she was actually hustling. She's actually working. Well, the most important part, I think, is that we've kept our, kept our guests waiting long enough. <laughs> 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 what better way to transition into <laughs> Mr. Jake Kasdan? Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, oh, Jake. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so nice to see you. Ah, uh, and so nice to be seen to uh, see you. Now, since we were talking about the other Jake, in this case, the Gyllenhaal, uh -huh. and Sam was kind enough to point out that the two of you might have worked with the young lad. I'm trying to remember we what didn't Sam work. was talking about. We didn't about, work with him. We didn't work with him. He visited our set on two occasions. He did. As It was right after October Sky. Okay. He and, and Krumholtz showed up together. Yeah, I'm remembering this a little bit. Yeah. They, he, Krumholtz was hanging out with Gyllenhaal at that yeah. time. Yeah. I know him only a little bit, and he's always been nicest guy. Yeah, yeah. Right? Oh, yes, very nice. There's something I'm forgetting. No, about there's this. nothing you're forgetting. No. I, 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 I had remembered that like he showed up and like you and Judd were like, oh, old buddy. Yeah, well, I uh, I knew him a little bit uh, when he was like a little kid because he went to school with my younger brother. Uh huh. Um, and uh, but only just uh, like a little. Um, uh, and then you know, run into him through the years. But he's he's great. I cannot wait to see that movie. It looks fantastic. It's. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's better than a trailer, which is rarely the case these days. Yeah, this is uh, true. That it's that, that you see the premise that well in the trailer, and you're still surprised and shocked and yeah. and entertained like crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah speaking yeah. of which, I'm gonna also need to know a little bit uh, what it was like for you uh, working with a a considerably younger Sam Levine. Absolutely. Uh, That's why I'm here. Uh, oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was it just the pilot that you directed, or did you direct? No, I uh, I directed of five of eighteen. Right. right. Um, so, the the pilot and the one right after the pilot. Um, in the great tradition of the pilot director doing the one right after. Now this was your first pilot. It was my first pilot and my first job in television. Yeah. Actually, it was sort of this fluky thing that happened. Um, That's what I was very very curious about. It was a it, it was a wild, you know, uh, wild thing that came sort of out of nowhere and ended up being a major determining event in almost everything that's followed since then, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, basically what happened was I had made one movie um, at that time called Zero Effect, and it was a... Thank you, Sam. Enjoyed it and, uh, thoroughly. <laughs> Enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. In fact, we're going to talk about that. So, yeah. So, but let's... So, to, so is that something Judd and Paul Feig had seen, or how did... The... As Judd tells the story, right, and I have no reason to doubt him really. <laughs> sure. He had not seen it, right. Um, he heard had about it. he had heard about it, and he had heard that it was good. It starred um, Bill Pullman and Ben Stiller. Judd and Ben, of course, had done Ben Stiller show together already, and he, uh, ha you know, Judd had this. Uh, a lot of people have told the story, I'm sure, but he, you know, he had this big. He was a had been working as a television writer primarily, um, had made this big deal at DreamWorks Television right. to de actually at DreamWorks to develop movies and TV shows, and uh, it was like a very it was something a lot of people knew about, and it had yielded uh, a pilot that he had written and made a you know a multi camera um, comedy, and then uh, Paul had come to him with the Freaks and Geeks pilot. And they uh, set it up at NBC fairly easily. It had already, you know, Paul had already written the pilot, which is a little bit unusual. Usually, you sure. sell an idea and then you know deliberate over it for nine months with right. a committee of executives. Paul had taken the initiative and actually written this pilot, um, sort of about his experiences growing up in Michigan. And he brought it to Judd. Judd loved it. Got NBC to agree to make it. Pretty much as it was, as he had written it, right. um, and so Judd started producing his first ever, really, um, you know, single camera anything. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, he'd worked on movies that he had that he had been among the producers, but this was, you know, 
he was first, the only guy. Kinda. First time at the helm. Yeah, and um, you know we had a lot of people in common, but didn't really know each other. And he clearly wanted to use someone outside yeah, the network I system, guess so. or, which happens. Certainly, there was someone more qualified he could have found who would have been eager to do it. In and fact, also, like, uh, and you were what twenty. I was really young. I mean, it's a very dubious decision. He called a young man whose work he didn't know yeah. and <laughs> asked him to take over. Uh, yeah, and you say there are other qualified people. We, I have 63. Yeah, exactly. There were 63, they, 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 in there fact, on the list. a lot of people that, of they, they, I'm sure they would have preferred. Yeah, I'm sure the network and, um, said, sure. Right. Yeah, I don't know how that part of it happened. It makes yeah. no sense. But right. he... Um, he called me up. We had met once or twice. I was in the, it was about a year after the first movie had come out and I'd been writing all year and somewhat futilely trying to come up with the screenplay for the next movie. And he called me sort of out of nowhere and said, there's this pilot that I'm making. And he kind of described it to me a little bit, described the opening sequence of the pilot that I uh, is still one of my favorite things about it. You know, it's, it starts on the, um, it's like, uh, you know, a football field at a high school and you see the sort of like football player and a cheerleader having this kind of overly emotive uh, conversation about their relationship and then you sort of drop down underneath the bleachers and it's like, these are the kids it's really about. And it's the, uh, you know, the sort of stoner freak kids and then you kind of like, you know, wheel over and see the geeks, that this, uh, you know, that the two groups comprise the cast, all of that. And um, he described it to me, I just thought it sounded, you know, fun and funny, and it was sort of a moment where I was dying to get away from my self and my computer and all of that, and I, sort of by the end of the phone call, without having read it, said, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> and. Um, went and sort of started making this pilot with the two guys, with Paul and Judd. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, but really, I, I just described actually the entire process of how it came to me and how I decided to do it. And, um, you know, the thing you can't imagine when something like that happens is that it's going to be... Worth a damn. Yeah, and it's going to be, for one thing, uh, you know, a show that people are still love years later, that it would be where I would make a set of friends and you know colleagues that I'd continue to work with forever. That you know uh, I've probably talked to Judd every week since. You know, it's acted as a ground zero for several careers. Yeah, I mean there right. are shows like SNL that have a history of doing that. Yeah, there are very few one season comedy half hours. It's a real that, that have that claim. Yeah, and this was an uh, Freaks was an hour. Oh, it wasn't it? Was, it, was, it feels like a half hour. I'm so it glad flies you by. said something. I was. I, I should have left it to you because yeah. you would have. Uh, you would have. You would have really. I would have never. That down. I'm, no, I'm and, still not. Uh, <laughs> and if on a game show, I would have risked the entire yeah. amount. Yeah. I had a mass. But everyone thinks it's a half hour because Isn't it's that a, it? yeah. It's it a comedy is, because it's a comedy. Because it's more comedy than not. Right. I'm sure it was a. Dream. And that was probably part of why it was hard for people to understand and kind of classify at the moment when it launched and all of that. As an know? hour. It was an hour-long comedy. There weren't a lot of dramedies in '90s. No, there weren't even a lot of single-camera comedies on network TV. I mean, right. it was it was um, sort of its own unique beast in yeah. in retrospect. You right. know? Yeah. Um, and tell me about the process of casting a Sam Levine. Oh boy. Well, you know, it was a interesting, funny thing. Well, the whole thing. Well, the Levine part of it is great. What we we started out. Um, as every story I hope start. you know this story, but I will tell the story again happily. <laughs> well, I mean, we had Paul Feig <laughs> here. We had Paul uh, This Feig. is a great story, and you're part of the story. We know? had Paul but, Feig uh, here, and we forced him to tell, to a tell bit, some version of the story. But not this. I mean, pretty much what happened was we, you know, Judd, uh, in the right as we were getting going, did sort of a, you know, was I, this was my first kind of introduction to a lot of what I know about how you make a pilot and how you make a TV show, and there was this key. A uh, bit of wisdom that he handed out early, which was a TV show is entirely about the cast. It's more important than the writing. It's more important than any other aspect of it because you need to find a group of people that you can continue to work with for a long time and actors that will, in fact, like inspire story rather than 
you know, constantly having to sort of zero in on a character. The and way the that you can in a movie, wait. for example, that you can right. get, um, I mean, it's a random example only because we were just talking about it, but like when even someone brilliant like Jake Gyllenhaal kind of zeroes in on this character in that movie, you know that he's kind of going to execute that for a finite amount of time. Right. And his performance is the sum of those decisions, right? And uh, how it's being interpreted and that, which is really uh, like a great, its own amazing thing. And then there's this slight variation in television, which is where you need somebody to be able to perform a role indefinitely, hopefully for years and years, um, through thick and thin, good and bad writing and whatever may Ebb happen. And flow, but you want the audience to feel like they can't wait to come back to these, exact, to these people. To the people. Yeah. So it's the character and the actor with the actor, you know, maybe taking a bigger piece of that, uh, you know, equation, right? Sure. And, um, and that was a revelatory thing. And I did, I it took a while to understand cause sort of just how that worked. Yeah, well, from a writer's standpoint, yeah, it from would a writer's be standpoint, your first it's, thought. Exactly. It's sort of a... How do a, I make these characters breathe and live? Yeah. Well, hire them. It was a very different way of thinking about it, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. I wonder who had told Judd because he, this was... Um, his, oh. Was this his first? No, he had done, uh, he had worked uh, on a couple of different shows. Probably most significantly for him was he had done a few years on Sanders. Right, um, but his first, Gary. his show. It was his first that he was in charge, you yeah. know. Um, but he'd learned other from Other than Masters. the Stellar show. Sure. But he had learned from the great, great people. And I think a lot of what he you know, was bringing to it at that time was what he had, I mean, he would tell you, you know, he had watched and studied these guys, yeah. and particularly Gary, you know. Um, anyway, we set out looking for a set of freaks and geeks, and... Knowing casting was everything. Knowing casting is everything, that, you know, we didn't want a bunch of refined uh, Hollywood commercial looking kids, you know, who smile too much and... Not if you're gonna call them freaks and geeks. Not if you're gonna call them freaks and geeks. That would seem like disingenuous and phony in a way that we right. couldn't stomach and we were very focused on a very real version of this. We needed to find actual geeks. The freaks turned out to be somewhat easier to find and given who they ended up being, uh, Seth Rogen, Jason Siegel, James Franco, Linda Cardellini, Busy Phillips. Um, it's amazing that we found them easily and that they all kind of gathered. Uh, honestly, like within a few, the first few days of casting, we had uh, all of them but Rogan, who, who, who turned up later in a casting call in uh, Canada. Right. Um, like an open call, walked in, auditioned. The other three, uh, Franco, Siegel, Linda, I think we had met in the first week of casting. Crazy. Crazy. Um, the geeks were really hard to find because we knew that we wanted like an authentic geek that doesn't look like the geek that everybody has, you know, imagined their whole lives. Just say hideously lives. ugly. We wanted uglier geeks. No, <laughs> right. we wanted, um, we wanted, want we, we wanted it to feel real. We wanted it to feel like, yeah, that kid is off standing in the corner. Um, alone and ostracized and alienated. <laughs> and so we set out on a nationwide search. Uh, it's hard to get those kids that fit that description into the audition, I think. You know, it's a little bit of a um, sort of surprisingly, like when you're really going for a deep authenticity there, it's hard to get to sort of connect with those people a little bit. Right. But not all of those people, Kevin. <laughs> No. Some of them float uh, in. Yes, and we started, we did a big open call in New York, and then we did a more targeted call with represented actors, which I believe Levine was I, at that time. I was represented. Working, uh, I don't know if working is the word. Uh, commercials. Had aspirations to work, had no, done commercials. Working -ish. And I, I, he was working-ish. He was working-ish. He was working-ish. Yeah. And he uh, <laughs> came in and he, he was read. 17 years old. He was 17. I was 16 when I read. Yeah. A month before my birthday. Yeah. Um, he looked very similar, but shorter and less without beard. a beard. Yep, shorter and less beardy. He came in, and what he lacked in experience or skill, he made up for <laughs> in wild enthusiasm. 
that oozed from every pore. You could see that he loved it and wanted to be there in Which every way. Which added to the authenticity it, of the geek. It was definitely a situation where you could look at a piece of tape and go, yep, this is the real thing we've been looking for. <laughs> this and, kid doesn't fit in anywhere. Nope. Of course, with that came a certain kind of... I don't know if poise is the word. No, it's definitely there. not. It's definitely not the word. Nope. It's related, though. It's whatever it is, it is that makes him Younger. absolutely perfect to do this with you every yeah. week. <laughs> yeah. He already had some hint of that as well, a sixteen-year-old. The, the truth is, he's the he old. could he could yeah hang in there and be funny with you right. like nobody's business. Ackerman. But the key element to this story is that the audition, which was showed his full. Um, you got a strong sense of the guy from the audition, and yeah, enough to lean in and go, we may have something here. And then the audition ends, and he says, can I do something else, though, for you, please? Was it my Shatner? And we all said, and if whoever the casting director was in the room says, it, absolutely, if there's something you want us to see, we want to see it. And he did a very... Um, Terrible. Devoted <laughs> and good. mediocre impression of your perfect Shatner yep. impression. And we the truly tape exists. It's stopped on the, internet. the tape. No, it absolutely exists. We yeah. stopped the tape and turned to each other and said, wait, go back. <laughs> <laughs> this is something, hey, come in here. Paul, come in here. There's something you need to see. And uh, that, was, that was the beginning. I, uh, it was the, the <laughs> yeah. combination of the audition and the just total chutzpah right. Um, <laughs> right. to sort of be this happy, this much smiling, to be asking to do something else in the first place, anything who does that, right. and then <laughs> to have it be your Shatner impression. <laughs> uh, we, uh, yep. What can I say? We fell in love. We, yeah. uh, we, how, what happened next? We came, we came, to, New came to New York and, York. and yeah. met a few people. And then I met Paul. But there's definitely a way of looking at it where, like, we came to New York to meet Sam Levine. That's oh, practically One could true. make that argument. Johnny yeah. Daly was there. <laughs> and then when we got there, John Daly turned up. Yeah. We, were, we didn't know we were going to see oh, John Daly. See. He, he was a, he kind of came into an audition while we were there. We couldn't find the lead kid, Sam Weir, the, the number one geek. Right. Um, it was really hard to figure that out. Yeah. And, um, and John came in and, and read, and it was one of those moments, and we had a few of them, where we were all kind of sitting there going, you know, looking at each other like, we're holy done. moly, this is the thing, and we've been looking for it. But that one took months and months, yeah. um, and we had pretty much everybody else already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have my uh, issues with the auditioning process mm -hmm. as a process that ultimately I, I've gone on about it a bit too much on the show, perhaps. And uh, there's a lovely passage in it in, in my book that's in your gift bag. Oh, um, sure. There's a gift bag? Yeah, yeah, there's a gift bag. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, when you're the f one of the first <laughs> podcasts, you have to <laughs> maintain some sort of integrity. <laughs> um, which is... The emotion you have mm -hmm. as an actor mm -hmm. on the set after I've hired you mm -hmm. is the opposite right. of the emotion when you come into audition. I don't even know yeah, what you're horrible. capable of, right. truly, until I get you on the set knowing you've been given the job. Right. I'm going to see enough of it, I hope, yeah. during the audition. Yeah. So how is that for you in terms of you see something in the room that grabs you, and, and, and obviously you're looking for someone to breathe life into a part that you've seen other actors do yeah. incorrectly or closely. Sure. It's not always a revelation mm -mm. when the person comes in. No. It's got to be a number of factors. It is. You know, it's interesting, because it's, um, it's a part of it that I don't really enjoy that much. I, I think yeah. when I started doing it, I enjoyed it more. I had a, a greater appetite for um, just the meeting people part of it and kind of like talking to people and trying to make them feel more comfortable and trying to sort of... Um, and there is something 
sort of unnatural about the whole thing and it's uncomfortable. And then you get to a point where you realize that also everyone involved for the most part kind of knows that and then it start, you start to worry about it a little less because everyone knows that sort of what the deal is, what we're the game pros is. Here. We're, we're all yeah. pros here. You know we knew what we wanted before you walked exactly. in. Exactly. You're either it or you aren't. Yeah. So See, my issue was I would, that. when I was on the other end, have been, I, I, would give, I kept giving notes to let them do it again and again yeah. and again. And I feel real. Am I doing this so that they can maintain their integrity, or am I doing it because I I, I really want to see different sides? But yeah, I well, found, it can be either thing. Yeah, yeah, I found that we would get forty five minutes behind instantly. Yeah. Because I just wanted to give notes to everyone. Yeah, and I've that's certainly been a thing. I've 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 had that thing a lot, that issue, and and then eventually started scheduling it differently, knowing yeah. that at least with certain characters where it's a major part, right? You know, give me twice as much time with everybody as you had been because right. I want to be able to give have notes. it be a serious... Uh, yeah, it's you give notes and also just have it be like we actually had a, a oh. moment about this. You know what I mean? But isn't part of the... I do, and isn't part of the giving the notes process and letting them go at it again about your uh, experimenting with with what the, it should be. What the relationship's going to be in terms of how the, not only how they take direction, mm -hmm. but what changes can be made on the fly. Yeah. Um, that's got to be a part of it. You're, you're gaining something, yeah. hopefully, by giving those notes. Yeah, for sure. And then you do have the experience, you know, uh, I mean, there's, it can be all different things, because you can have a moment where you know, somebody walks in and blows you away and you know it's a huge thing. You can have a moment where somebody walks in and, and blows you away in a different, like the Sam Levine story there is a great story, which is like, that is actually us going, this is like a young kid who's just learning to do this and this is gonna be really fun. Right. And that's a different kind of thing, you right. know? Right. Um, and then you can have it where it's like really, tricky to find something. I mean, using the Freaks and Geeks example, and I've had this come up again and again and again, you know, there can be a character where it's just something you love in the script, and people come and read, and for some reason it's just impossible to love as they read it. And you can see a dozen or 50 people read something and go like, is this just not what I thought it was? Right. It's not funny. I'm not that interested. I'm not, you know, we had one on um, on Freaks with the uh, the character's name was Millie. It was this, the little girl who's like the mathlete, former best friend to Linda's character, Lindsay, that, you know, and it was just, we saw a lot of perfectly talented little, you know, kids re reading Millie and had completely lost faith in it. And I remember sitting there with uh, Feig, you know, I've, like we'd read a lot of Millie's at this point. And you, you know, by the time you've been doing this for months, you're, it's, you're a little run ragged and ready to start. And um, just like, is this just not the idea we thought it was? It seems so funny on the page. Why is it not funny when we see it? Why when we, they come in too broad, and when we try to make it smaller and more real, it's just boring. And, the, and then this great kid came in, Sarah Hagen, and just was perfect immediately, and just starts reading it. And for some reason, Had the scenes energy. you've heard a hundred times yeah. just are infused with a new kind of life and reality. And you're laughing at something you thought you would never be able to laugh at again. And, and it just kind of wakes up. and. And that can be really satisfying too, and that can sort of teach you something about what the material is and right. where it plays and where it lives, and hopefully you can extrapolate it to other corners of the thing you're working on. And then there's the bonus that came out of the auditioning process. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah you can get great stuff out of it. I mean, and you know, different people do it in different ways. I mean, um, you know, Judd has a thing he does where he has auditions for months and months and, you know, with the lead actor generally, kind of really workshopping what that character is going to be and is going to do and, you know, like there's a whole sort of 
thing to it that comes out of that. Right. Yeah. Um, we like to take live questions from our audience. Sure. Whenever possible. Jamie likes to forward them to me, as she will. In the meantime, um, I do want to talk about uh, the TV set, since we're, mm -hmm. we're discussing the pilot process and the sure. auditioning and everything else. Um, and I think, I can't imagine how many uh, writers, directors, showrunners had been through the TV pilot process who thought to themselves, People need to know about this. <laughs> the world at large needs to know how 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 vapid the, yeah. the executives are, how right. how how awful the experience is, how they yeah. find the center, the truth of a moment in a script and add water directly to it. <laughs> but their savant-like ability yeah. to find the mark. Yeah, yeah. To, w to add the water. To so just sort of screw something up yeah. completely and but it is a irreparably. Savant. Yeah. They can zero in on it like you never <laughs> thought an animal could. Right. Uh, how many uh, people thought this? This ha the world has to know about this. And then, yeah. uh, and I can't imagine you were even the first to creatively mm -hmm. attempt to do it. And then ultimately, uh, masterfully. Uh, well, thank did. You. So I, I'm curious about the process and and the genesis and, mm -hmm. and how that happened. TV set came from, um, I mean, in terms of the inspiration for it, it came from watching a bunch of my friends go through pilot season. Uh, you know, I had made a few at that point. I'd had some really good experiences, because, uh, you know, the, my first one we were talking about was Freaks, and then right after that, we I was working with John Undeclared, Undeclared. and which was also I directed the pilot for that, but then left to go make a movie, but kind of kept returning to you know was was close to it through its whole life. Um, those were both shows that you know got canceled quickly, but were actually pretty good creative experiences. Um, they were not you know, the contaminated struggle. in that way. I, I made a pilot version of a, my movie, a Zero Effect, that was a less good experience, but not dreadful. And then I watched as some of my very good friends uh, and people that we had, I had worked on the other shows with went and made their own pilots, and those were generally some really terrible experiences. So I got to see yeah. exactly how it works very close up. I would, you know, be close enough to those projects to really sort of see it happening in horrible slow motion. And um, you eventually just hear the same stories and see the same things so many times. There's only so many you variations. Like, well, this is how it works. Yeah. This is how everything gets yeah. ruined. Um, so there was, there was that part of it. And then in terms of where I was, it's like I'd been writing something else, again, just like very, uh, having a hard time finishing a script for a long time. And then had this idea to do that movie. I originally thought maybe I would do it as like an improvised movie. Um, I don't know why that was the thought. It was, I think it was a bailing on writing kind of thought. You know, like, a, like <laughs> was, maybe this would be a movie oh. I could make that wouldn't require me to write anything. But then I... You time code like, I love some Spinal Tap. tap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was sort of like maybe like in that, yeah. you know, mode of aspiring to that, that kind of thing. And then was like, or I could just write it and then wrote it really quickly after like a year of just trying to wrestle Selene Alls to the ground. And because um, it was stuff that came pretty easily and, you know, it was familiar stuff. And, you know, had like one of the great experiences ever making it because everybody in it, you know, it's uh, David Duchovny and Scorny Weaver and uh, Yohan Griffith, Judy Greer, Fran Kranz, and Lindsay Sloan were like the and Justine Bateman, um, you know, like this amazing group of people, a lot of whom I'd never worked with before, and everybody was just so kind of... We get it. Yeah, and excited about it, you know, and it was a little movie. We, we did it quickly and um, fairly inexpensively, and it was like one of the great experiences ever, and uh, it entered the world with a resounding nothing uh you know wait did something happen there and uh, it was just this tiny release? little movie release yeah and um well who's and then has had this great afterlife which is you know big lesson to yeah. it kind of which is they go on for a long time after that it was this tiny little distributor that right. got absorbed into a different tiny little you know one of those things well speaking of which though when 
zero effect as a first timer. Mm -hmm. You were 24? Mm -hmm. 23, 24. Mm -hmm. Where does the funding for your first script, where does that, where, I mean, we had... Where did Zero Effect? Yeah, I mean, we had Baby Ripen, as we insist on calling him here, uh, Jason. Uh-huh. And he talked about the, the, the growing up in, in filmmaking royalty. Yeah. Uh, closes more doors than it opens. It wasn't until he went off and tried to create a commercial directing career on his mm -hmm. own away from uh, those allegedly open doors uh, that he had something to show for himself as opposed to in name only. You uh, started so young also mm -hmm. um, that I'm just curious because rather than asking, you know, through the research, we just find this painful uh, recurring questions for you about being the son of. My curiosity uh, comes from... You mean in previous interviews? And stuff? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So, so my curiosity comes from the, the aspect of the journey that we all face, which yeah. is how does one go about making a name for themselves? So yeah. in, it, while it may appear to some there's an advantage if the, if the last name is familiar, uh, there's no question that you, you, if you don't show the goods on your own, uh -huh. then you become an annoyance, quite frankly, because of the similar last name. Right, right, the identical last name. And yeah. who the fuck wants, the identical uh, last name. And so familiar in the sense that it's familiar in the yeah, marketplace. Yeah, yeah. But who the fuck oh, wants right. that burden, by the way? So I would yeah. assume you're in a faster race to make a name for yourself than people even yeah. would want for you if you're well, going to be a filmmaker. Probably, you know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think that, um, first of all, there is an enormous advantage, and it would be crazy to say that there's not an enormous advantage. It's just that the advantage is not exactly what people think it is. Right. And that is completely understandable also, because first of all, most people don't know how any of this works. Secondly, they don't, certainly don't know how that works, you know, I mean, it's a very kind of unique and uh, limited experience, right, to be the sort of like second generation and working, right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people, there's a lot more who try to, you know. Um, yeah. You know, the huge, huge advantage is this incredible uh, proximity and sense of how something very, very complicated and very sort of um, esoteric you know, you learn how it works sort of osmotically by growing up, which yeah. is an enormous thing because... Well, but you're also almost, having to pay attention you have to pay and it. wanting to be a student. Right. You have to want to, that's for sure. But you are just kind of familiar with and aware of a whole set of dynamics that are not intuitive or obvious. So right. for a lot of people like almost everybody who comes here to do this, you know, there's a huge process of this education of just, like, what are even the rules here? Right. You know, like, just what, what, okay, now I'm here, what do I do? Where do I get an apartment? What do I, you know, like right. the, who do I even try to call now? Right. You know, there's all of that. What it takes to get onto a set, what it takes to be able to be on more than one set. How long yeah. does it take you before you realize, oh, I'm going to be bored within seven minutes of visiting right. someone else's set. <laughs> exactly. And once you're there, what do you do? And if you were allowed to do anything, what, would is, what is it you're even trying to be allowed to do? And, you know, how the machine works. Um, both the business machine and also just the technical machine and creatively, like, how, you know, just um, where does all of this come from? Mm -hmm. And that takes some figuring, you know, because even if someone explains it to you, it you have to see it for a while before you get what it is. Um, so there was this huge, huge head start in terms of knowing really a lot about how this worked, you right. know, while I was still a kid. Right. Um, and then there was this other huge head start of having a father who I w is doing it, who I was very, very close to. I didn't have a tortured Hollywood relationship with in any way. I mean, we have a, a very close relationship that's always been a very, um, you know, healthy and positive relationship, like since I was a kid. 
and so, and with both of my parents, and, and particularly, um, you know, as pertaining to this, particularly with him. Um, so for you, it would be, show me on the doll where dad showed you how to point the camera. Yeah, okay, sort of. <laughs> I mean, we, we were, I mean, there are pictures of me on the set looking through the camera on, you know, when I was a little tiny kid, like right. that kind of, so, so kind of, you yeah. know. Um, I mean, there was certainly a little bit of growing up with, you know, as I got older, like, is, do I want to do the same thing that he does? Do I sure. want to, um, you know, is that daunting? Uh, some of the, you know, questions like that you're alluding to, of just, you know, would you? But go there are big footprints and all of that. All you know? Also going from dabbling, contemplating. Right. To actually doing is it. Is there an epiphany? Is there just a, over time? What, what was the? Um, you know, I started writing plays it? as a teenager and liked writing and dialogue and I would put them up and I liked hearing people say what I'd written and sort of I liked making an audience laugh and that kind of thing. Where were you putting up these small ones? Like in little theaters in sure. LA. And, um, as a teenager? As a teenager. And the actors were also? Mostly teenagers or, you know, pulled from a small company of adults that I knew who might be willing to do that. Right. Uh, in retrospect, sort of thankless request. <laughs> um, <laughs> so are you 16, 17, 18, or are you 13, 14, Yeah, like 15? 17, 16, 17. Okay. Um, they were just angling for future work. Yeah. Why do you think Ryan O'Neill <laughs> exactly. did your show? I mean, it has well, not panned out for them. But, but, uh, <laughs> but there, you know, we laugh, but therein is that advantage that you were talking about, maybe, you know, among the, 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 the adult actors, the conversations that you, maybe you're not privy to are, are, are just that. Well, he, what he's written is, is funny, and this could be fun, but yeah. also this could lead to, because as artists, yeah. at some point you realize there is a business to this. Right. There is about getting any foot up and leg up that you can. Yeah. So, but then again, you have to produce. You have to well, fulfill. You, you have to You surprise. have to. I mean, you know, I think that I always wondered going into it, like how much... You know, you, you, there's just naturally you wonder, like, is this helping me? What is this doing that I'm not aware of? How does it affect how people talk about me in a way that I don't know, positively or negatively? Right. You know, you have a strong sense that a lot of it's probably negative. Um, <laughs> right. You know, all, uh, you, you know that, uh, of course, who wouldn't be sort of, um, it would be so easy for people to be resentful. And You're aware of how this much? Is... Yeah, sure. And how much do I care about that? But also, since there's literally nothing I can do about it, I, you know, I can conduct myself in, in by according to whatever rules I'm, I'm going to. You know, I sort of like had guidelines for how I would try to separate myself and do my own thing on my own terms and all of that. But you know, it's such a small town. The reality is, you, you're running into the same people all over the place, so you can't really get that much distance. Um, you know, so you sort of have to decide how you're going to navigate that, how you feel about it. And I think at the very beginning, it, I had a lot of like anxiety about it, sort of agitas about it. And then as soon as I started actually doing things and it became clear that I could at least for a little while sustain, like there would be a next thing, I just stopped thinking about it to a huge extent to where like it just wasn't that much of a... A don't, thing anymore, you yeah, know. Don't stop to contemplate; just keep moving forward. Yeah, kind of, and it just wasn't what I was talking about with people every day, you know. Right. In terms of when you're actually doing it, you're not you're not talking about it all the so time. So when you decide, in retrospect, now when I imagine somebody saying to me, "Will you take a look at my kid's script?" I can't conceive of what would happen that I would actually end up reading it. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. it, it's so true. It's I can't so true. imagine. I mean, it must have. It would. It would seem. I mean, I never had him kind of operating for me in that way. Like, like I say, I was always sort of very focused on, you know, he had nothing to do with anything that I worked on for a really long time. And the only time he ever has was he came on as kind of a producer on um, TV set. Right. It was the only time in 15 years that we've actually worked together. And what was the reason on that one? He just loved it. And it was, we were both sort of interested in the possibility of, sure. you know, whether it would be possible to work together and also whether it would be possible to, you know, what a tiny little movie experience would be like. You know? And how was that for you? Working together? It was great. I mean, he, you know, it was great. It was great. We had a really good time sort of 
with the parts of it that were fun. There's a lot of anxiety surrounding making a small independent movie, as I'm sure you know. And uh, you know, there's just the they sort of feel like they're going to fall apart at every moment until, well, forever really, till you wrap, kind of. Yeah. And you know, we shared a lot of that and took that ride together, and it was kind of, um, you know, it was great. It's yeah. great, yeah. Come out the other end of it. The yeah. Be the better for it. Yeah, and we both we both love the movie, you know, and we're, we're happy about it afterwards and happy to have done that together. So with Zero, yeah. um, as I'll insist on calling it henceforth. Yeah, I do um, too. Uh, how, how difficult was that first time as a 23, 24-year-old who had finally gotten to the place where, where you're ready to stand alone and say, all right, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna try this. I'm yeah. gonna direct my own screenplay. Yeah. And uh, who cares? Anybody? Somebody? Yeah. Because yeah. um, the first time at the plate for these various moments yeah. in one's career are, are, are crazy impactful, more so than you realize at the time daunting and um and i feel like baby steps is what you're experiencing when you're going through it mm -hmm. if i can just get this done right if i could just get this actor to read it yeah if i could just so any of those moments that stay with you to this day would be yeah I, you know in terms of how it happened i had written a couple of scripts prior to that and then this one i took me a really long time and then i at the end of it on Zero Effect, it was just, I was getting a really good reaction, and it sort of seemed like I might be able to get it together to make it. It was deliberately scaled in a way that it wouldn't cost that much money to make. Um, you know, I, I was trying to do it in a way where you could uh, sort of, you could make it, you know, any way you, uh, Somehow you could put it together. You could make it for a couple million dollars. You could make it for much more than that. Right. And um, you know that it would be had two great parts. That you know, I mean, there was some level of design that way because I had I had had a couple of things just not feel that way at the end that they were particularly makeable or that they were getting the kind of reaction that I. Once and, again, it's um, about casting. Yeah. Exactly, casting and just how much are people? How excited are people about this? You yeah. know, and I could was just getting a really nice reaction to the script and there was some deliberation about like do I try to sell it is it that kind of thing or um, yeah, you know as a spec screenplay but it was sort of a weird movie and very quickly determined that I was going to at least try to make it myself you know and then That's it was about decision. finding actors and yeah it's a big decision it's a big decision. You know, it's a big decision for anyone to decide. I mean, it's, they always say, you know, everybody wants to direct, which I think is true. If you actually know what it is to direct, then it's kind of a bigger decision, you know, when it's not just an abstraction, yeah. as I'm sure you're going through, right? It's sort of like a yeah. thing you're, you're... Yeah, but I think ultimately everyone who says they want to direct, and the old joke of, of, of that, mm -hmm. is about... I want to be the storyteller. Right. I want to be able to control the telling of this particular story. Yeah. Whether you come at it as an actor, whether you come at it as a writer, there's this feeling of, but until I'm head right. of, of this storytelling process, yeah. I, someone's going to fucking second guess and undermine my ability. Right. Um, and it does take a certain amount of a either healthy or not ego. Yeah. To, to desire that. You know, I, I got to the point in my life uh, a few administrations ago <laughs> where I realized I can no longer trust anyone who chooses to run for the President of the United States. Yeah. Because the ego it takes to wake yeah. up and go, you know what? I was thinking about it, honey. <laughs> I should be in charge of everything. I, I should be the leader yeah. of the free world. Don't you think so? I need you on board. Yeah, yeah. I should be in charge of everything. I mean, can that yeah. ego be trusted? Yeah, no, I don't absolutely. think so. Absolutely. Um, uh, there are analogies, <laughs> for sure. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that um, the, 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 
I think of it always, and I thought of it then as, you know, I don't know that some, uh, I had no sort of illusions that uh, some hand had reached down and told me I was ready to direct. No burning book. Um, yeah, it was more like, I know this story very, very well. You, I could you've do, seen I it could do this. I, I, could t I know how to tell this story. Right, and visually you saw it as the writer. Yeah. Uh, doing the rewrites. Exactly right. Yeah. And you know that you, and again, this is a place where, you know, experience and having been around the process is, is hugely helpful, which is I knew that I would surround myself with people who would help me. Department heads. And, yeah, who, you know, with, the, with people who would know more about their part than I had to. Yeah. And that, that, that there's no shame in that, that you, in fact, that's still the case. I'm still always surrounded by people who know more about their part than I do, you know, and I've, and I've done plenty of it now. And it's just, um, you have the advantage in a collaborative form of working with talented people. And then I had the sort of luck that the group of people I hired for that movie were just astounding. And I learned a ton in the course of doing it on this very fast curve that I think, you know, because I've talked to a lot of my, my friends and people who've done this about their first movie experiences, and I just kind of like yeah. had this really fortunate thing where, where well, I, you I picked exactly that. the right people. I, I think not always for that reason, but, um, right. you know, I, I hired a DP, maybe the most interesting, kind of funniest one of those is I hired a um, cinematographer named Bill Pope, who, you know, Bill is, has since, and in fact, immediately after Zero Effect went and made the first Matrix movie, um, and has since been working entirely in that sort of mode, or almost entirely, of like three Matrix movies, you know, multiple Spider-Man movies, the biggest, most complicated, um, you know, visually audacious kind of uh, huge o kind of movies, and then right before that, did Zero Effect with me, and then, and then the Freaks and Geeks pilot with <laughs> that's us. That's right. Um, that's lightning in a bottle. He he that did really Zero is. Effect with me. Went to Australia and shot The Matrix for a year or whatever. Came back. I somehow convinced him, against all of his better judgment, to come and do the Freaks and Geeks pilot. And I believe it was like the as Matrix we were opened while we were shooting. While we were shooting, when we, <laughs> uh, like the last day I think of the of shooting the Freaks pilot was like Bill was getting calls about like Matrix's arriving, which was you know it's ridiculous. Couldn't have been a bigger <laughs> yes. Uh, like I, I mean, it's almost hard to think of anything quite like it in terms of like just a movie that's kind of changing everything for a minute, you know, yeah. um, and. Um, so, you know, but Bill, who I had basically just met and liked, and he liked the script, and I just liked what he was like, you know, in the first couple of days, and the last couple of days of prepping that movie, basically, like, made it his, just had some moment of his own, like a personal, like, interior moment of his own that was like, I'm going to teach this guy how a camera works now. And I remember the first shot of the first day he said this is what it looks like on this kind of lens and this is what it looks like on this kind of lens and you see the difference on their faces and you see the difference in the background and um that's extraordinary i mean three quarters of what i know about a camera i learned from bill on the first movie in the first couple weeks of making zero effect yeah about how to move how to um but also prioritize the fact certain kinds of things i mean it was a the huge, fact that you wanted thing. that lesson also. I was very fortunate yeah. in the first real movie uh, was Barry Levinson's film Avalon. And because he had won all the awards and, and whatnot on Rain Man wow. just prior, yeah. he was sort of given complete and utter freedom yeah. to, to do what, it, and, and it ends up being this huge saga and, and, yeah. and arguably, uh, I couldn't be more biased to some of us, his, his cinematic masterpiece. Yeah, one of them. But his genius, Amazing, as, he, really. as he uh, was limited by, is great writing and great casting. Yeah. And then hires an Alan Davio as a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. But no interest to learn 
yeah. the e education that you got. Yeah. Literally uh, detaching himself from it. Would rather sit and be sort of a, a, a comedian. Yeah. And and yell, Alan. Yeah. Alan, he's not ready. Al, he's not. <laughs> it doesn't matter if he's lighting a football or a football stadium. It's three hours. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> and you know, Alan yeah. Davio from E.T. Empire yeah. of the Sun, Color Purple. Uh, yeah. Just a, one of the greats, Picasso, yeah. and, and, and uh, but I do think there's a chasm between the the way he went about it, mm -hmm. which which was partly what you were talking about, which is writing and casting, and then the desire to absorb and learn yeah. these other departments. Yeah, you don't need to have the desire no. to learn the other part of it if you are coming from that other perspective, if you're coming from a, a sort of more textual and performance-oriented uh, Were you instantly fascinated which I was. with the lesson that Pope Yeah, well, Pope that's was the offering? thing, is that I just uh, gravitated towards that and was really interested in that part of it, and I'm still really interested in that part of it. Like, have a, a sort of um, well, kind of uh, only tangentially related kind of appetite, but, but real appetite for sort of the technical part of how it works. Well, let's talk digital versus film then, a little yeah. bit. Um, have you, did you make a transition? Yeah, I transitioned uh, almost entirely to digital a little before other people did, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, TV set, actually, was the first one that I did digital. Um, and wanted to because I wanted to have the experience and we had very little money and it seemed like it would save money although I don't think it really did probably it would have been similar at the time um, but I really there was a part of it I loved and while that is uh, not popular these days and I'm glad it isn't because it is important that somebody save film from completely disappearing and there's a handful of people who are directors who are basically single-handedly keeping Kodak making film right now, which is great. Uh, we need to have it. Um, but then you have... I did like working the other way. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I continue to... Almost everything I've done since has been on uh, digital formats that have just gotten better and better. The cameras get better and better. What I made your, a bad teacher on film, but other than that, everything since then has been digital. What are your digital cameras of choice? You know, the, the ones that you like? Now it's just the Alexas, the, the Arri Alexas, the clear killer app, you know, amazing, amazing camera. And it looks stunning. You can do incredible things and, you know, you can shoot a movie from the light of a house lamp if you need to and you can get just beautiful kind of effects from it and very easy to work with and it's great. Fincher swears up and down on the red, doesn't he? Still? Yes, which is like an eccentric, uh, thing at this point, but, you know, I mean, he's a genius, and that's his tool, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and in terms of the writing process, um, we've talked a little bit about it on the show. Uh, as a proud member of the Writers Guild mm -hmm. since 1987 myself, I, uh, when asked on those rare occasions, insist to uh, vomit out the uh, first draft. Make yourself a little skeleton there, because the whole process is really about rewriting. Uh -huh. And you will, in fact, rewrite until someone takes it away from you. If you're smart, mm -hmm. you'll just keep rewriting. Mm -hmm. How is the process for you? What is the procedure? Do you work best alone when writing? Is I do, mostly. Um, you know, uh, I think that's a really good way of thinking of it. I have had a... Uh, tortured relationship with it and so I it's worked differently for me at different times I've had multiple uh, scripts that I've spent over a year on in a really brutal kind of way that have never come to any satisfying conclusion like not just that they didn't get made like didn't get you know I mean I always got to the end but in the ugly way where like you show it to people and they're like really, this is the end, or, you know, like, it's right. just like, where there's some hugely complicated aspect to it, and I didn't really solve it, you know, I've had that happen a few times, and then I've had movies come really quickly, and, right. um, that are kind of, like, joyful to write, and, uh, just a lot less kind of, you know, stewing about it, um, I do think that in general, 
you know, revision is the key to the whole thing, like you're saying. Uh, I've also had it, though, where I've started writing too soon and get 50 pages in and realize that I just don't actually know where I'm going. Um, right. Uh, you know, I, uh, I don't have it to a... I've never had the same thing work repeatedly enough to where I feel like I truly know what it is that I do, and I've spent a lot of time. In terms of the design know. and the formatting and the bullet points and the In terms outline. of just approach, yeah, yeah, like how much do I need to know before I start, um, right. you know, what's going to make this work or not. I do find that I've, the ones that are kind of easier to write, people tend to like more too, mm -hmm. you know. There just seems to be a sort of a relationship between sort of how much um, kind of like by the, the natural flow of the process and also like th it seems to translate to have people enjoying them more a little bit. Well, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I mentioned you before we have uh, questions from the audience. I want to allow them into the room. Mm -hmm. um, there are, let's see, the one of the forms of questions we do uh, is a rapid fire group of five questions. <laughs> They're this or that. Mm -hmm. but specifically designed for the guest, like okay. a Coke or Pepsi kind of questioning. So questions that don't exactly have answers, or that have... The answers are, are your answers are, right, they don't yeah. have correct answers. That's right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, first we have a couple of, uh, uh, I noticed smart-ass questions from, uh, from the Twitterverse, at Eric, McNamee. We think that's a real name, McNamee? Nope. It seems like... <laughs> <laughs> it seems like... What's your name, you know McNamee? Yep. Uh -huh. yep. It's like 123 Fake Street. Yeah, yeah that's Eric right. Eric McNamee. Um, so this will be... This, we're going to file this under annoying. Okay. I, oh, that's the qualifier. Like that. And yet it's adorable enough that you forwarded it and I feel the need to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> Why haven't... Uh, we ever seen you and J.J. Abrams in the same room at the same time? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a glasses question. <laughs> it's a Jew. It's, it's, it's a Jew question. question. Yeah. yeah, it's a Jew uh, with glasses and, and a healthy I, I head of hair. I get told I look like a cartoon character all the time. I get told I look like Tina Belcher constantly. So from Bob's Burgers. Yeah. Such a, such a um, here's one that cuts a little closer to the uh, different bone, as uh -huh. it were. What are your thoughts on the new Star Wars? Title. I think it's great. What did you expect him to say? <laughs> Honest to God. <laughs> a little backstory here. A little context. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your pops uh, worked on two of the original three. Yeah. Uh, as a screenwriter, and then it wrote um, the current current one, yeah. which is shot being shot shot it's uh, mostly in the shot. can in the can, post. Yeah. yeah. And the title, of course, Sam is. Uh, the Age of Voltron. No, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rise of the Empire? Or something? What is no, it? No, no, no. You were Don't, not even close. Say, speak, Kenny. The Force Awakens. The yeah. Force Awakens, that's it. Yeah. I have Force not Awakens. been reading my uh, fanboy <laughs> newsletter recently. <laughs> I love putting Sammy on. But you really just came up with something and volunteered it as if that were the title. Sure. I knew it was <laughs> in the ballpark. I knew it was something Rise of the Age of the Dawn of the Things. <laughs> And this last third question from uh, the McNamee, it's like Jew McJewington. This is um, is uh, that's a real question. That's a real. This third one is the real question, and I think it it gets to the heart of the matter, of why the show should exist. It's a Jew more thing. so than any of the yeah. questions I've asked yet, and it's uh -huh. not Jew related. <laughs> What's your favorite smoothie flavor? Uh, what well, really? Yes. <laughs> um, I insist that the audience ask the silly question. Yeah. No, I get it. I don't even know where to. I mean, I. Do you even have one? I feel like I've been thinking about it too long. Already? I, 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 yeah. yeah. I, uh, something with mango. I, yeah. I was just going to say something with mango. Is that something you know about me? <laughs> From uh, way back. Yeah. From way back, Jim. There's certain things you remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, every now and then we'd have a I was like, actually just truck. about to say mango. Yeah. Yeah. Good well, instinct. Well, You're right, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nailed it. Uh, what else is, <laughs> is out there? Um, <laughs> let's get to um, how it feels then to lend uh, expertise to other people's films. Uh, hmm. Jennifer Westfeld. Yes. 
uh, wrote, directed, starred in Friends, Friends with, with Kids. Kids. Uh, had first asked you to direct yep. her script for her to star in. Yeah. Um, you end up... Has uh, she ever been here? John's been here. Yeah. Her uh, that, ledge, Sure, that was great. Her lesser half. Yeah. John Hamm attempted to come in here uh, and be unattractive. Yeah. He worked, uh, he wore a, a, a sweat-stained ball yeah. cap. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 11 yeah. o'clock hour growth. And it still didn't work. Didn't yeah. Work. No. no. He's just... Uh, <laughs> That's the deal. Effortlessly... Yeah. Uh, Charming, yeah. handsome, and really funny. When uh, when the Lord is asked if he ever gives with both hands, he points to John. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Case in point. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so here's a situation where where there's an existing uh, uh, mm -hmm. relationship, uh, hopefully mostly professional, where Jennifer says, "I'd <laughs> like you to uh, to direct something I've written and I'd like to star in." And yeah. where is it in you that says maybe you should direct? You just know yeah, you know, the funny thing about it is there was a little bit of a relationship, and I've thought about this a lot since, but we barely knew each other, That's really. I mean, we, um, we had both started out uh, uh, right around the same time. She had auditioned for Zero Effect and um, gotten kind of close. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that was, you know, 15 years <laughs> before or something, or, you know, 13 years before. Right. And... Um, I would run into her very occasionally, and I always liked her, and I liked her movies. I liked Kissing Jessica Stein a lot. And, um, but she had called me up and asked me to direct this movie. I was still finishing uh, Bad Teacher, and had uh, my wife had just had our first kid, and I just like couldn't quite wrap my head around it right at that moment, but said, you should do it. Because it was so obvious, and it was not a, in that particular case. In Jen's case, it was. It is just um, a matter of you saying, "Why aren't you?" Yeah, kind of. It doing was a it little yourself? bit like I, I could tell from talking to her that it just had a little bit of like, "What's going on here that's preventing you from doing this?" Because obviously, you think you can, and you can, and yeah. you wrote it, and you're a real writer, and a real, right. you know, and she's just hugely talented, and. Um, and eventually she kind of relented. Um, and then what ended up happening was that sort of, because she was a first time director who was also starring in the movie, yeah. um, understandably, you know, there was some feeling from the people who were like paying for it that it would be good if she had some fortification in the process of doing it, which, you know, most people need sure. um, the first time out. And so I agreed to come produce it with her Maybe I kind of volunteered to be a that kind of a presence, but right. then what happened was, as it got closer and closer, it became clear that they, that you know, there would be good for everybody if I was actually kind of around, as opposed to just in name only. Yeah, and you know, making the recommendation <laughs> and, uh, that she should direct it, and then bailing as they went to New York and shot this whole movie. So I was ended up there for pretty much the whole production of that movie, like. Um, you know, in proximity to it. And it was, uh, I produced it with, with uh, Jan and John and, um, you know, had a great time doing it with them, actually. Like, yeah. had a really good, it was a hard movie. It was very physical, you know, ambitious little movie to do on the streets of New York um, in the middle of the winter. Uh, but they got this incredible group of people to come play those parts, and, and it was fantastic. And she did a great job, as we all knew she would. You yeah, know. yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, man. So um, our our friend Colin Hanks mm -hmm. uh, tweeted about his excitement of your being here. Ah, very nice. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned <laughs> on I mentioned on the Twitter that you were going to come to the show, and he love that guy. He insisted on speaking out. Um, Yes, uh, as, a, as a talent, as a former guest of this show, um, yeah. a documentary filmmaker now himself. Um, but in terms of uh, right. uh, directing him mm -hmm. and, and the um, whirling dervish that is Jack Black mm -hmm. in the Orange County, yeah. a little bit about that experience. Yeah, yeah. That was a great experience. It was, um, that was my second movie. That was the one that I, I went to go make Orange County. I left the, uh, having made the pilot for Undeclared, I went and headed off into a year of Orange County. Mike White had written that script, right. um, who had been a writer on uh, Freaks, and he's a brilliant guy, and um, had written 
this really, really funny little movie. And um, uh, I, I loved it. I hopped into it. We, again, it was a long kind of process finding all those leads. And um, Colin was just sort of perfect to do that thing and already had all of those kind of comedy moves just, uh, you know, totally natural to him. Uh, certain kind, you know, it's a kind of comedy. I've made a couple of them and that particular one is probably the most extreme version of a comedy that is uh, where you know that you need the audience to have a good time and laugh while watching somebody in distress the entire time. You know, so, so it's a movie that, you know, sort of lives and dies on how much fun it is to watch someone having a crisis at a fairly high level, you know, the whole time. And it can get irritating <laughs> you know, very quickly. It's not in the hands and, of the most charming uh, person you can get your hands exactly on. Exactly right. Yeah. And um, that was the kind of the challenge of finding that thing. And then Colin, who had just come off a TV show, um, came and read for it. And he was just really fun and funny and appealing and winning doing that thing. Mm. Um, and it was very early in the Jack Black experience. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, to be. It was right after everybody realized that he was one of the funniest people on the planet, but right before everybody started deploying him that way. Um, it was after uh, High Fidelity, I think, like right after. But it was kind of his first movie that he was, um, you know, being treated as. A face on the poster, kind of. Yeah. And um, he's just brilliant. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, he's one of the, remains to me one of the funniest people on the planet. For I've sure. worked with him a bunch now because I've gotten him to come do little things in other movies I've made. And um, I just totally love working with him. He's, he's an amazing, you know, sometimes if you do this with, if you make comedies mainly, you get to see some of the like incredible people, you know? You know that thing when you're on set and you just like, somebody just kind of lights the whole thing up and you kind of can't believe what it's like. And Jack is one of those people who every time out, it's like a virtuoso kind of, yeah. you know. It's interesting too, because people, are, you know, your sense of him is that he's loose and wild and that there's something, um, He's so kind of effortless in what he does, appears so effortless that it, y you, you have the sense that it's like somebody just kind of... Making it up. Making it up and... Uh, no process. Yeah, and in fact, he's got the sort of grace of like a ballet dancer or something. And really all does. of the physicality and all of the um, voice and, you know, uh, it's just amazing. Yeah. And, you know, in Orange County, I remember because I'd always been a fan and I loved, I, I had known him a little, I knew his work, you know, I, and I was a big Tenacious D fan and all of that. Um, but I remember seeing, like, oh, this is a guy who's gonna do it 12 times differently and in interesting ways and want to do another one if you come in with an idea, you know, just like endless kind of appetite to find the funniest version of the thing right. and completely in it, you know. Yeah. And I mean, he came and did a little, just recently, last year he came and did uh, two scenes in my last movie, Sex Tape, and it was um, one of these things where, you know, I'd been working with only great people in that movie, and Jack came in for two days at the end and, like, walks into rehearsal in a scene where he's going to talk for three pages, and he's off book, and he's perfect. And it's just, like, one of those things where in the rehearsal, a bunch of pros are standing around, and Jason Segel turned to me and was just like, He's just unreal. Like, and they've made five movies together or something. It's just, you know, like, it's just, yeah. that's how it's done. And he's, yeah. he's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I just say the one Please. last thing about Orange County? Apart yeah. from being a great movie, one of my favorite things about it is I remember as you guys were making it going, so Jay Keston, <laughs> Colin Hanks, yeah. and Skylar Fisk. That's right. <laughs> Like it's a whole generation, yeah, a whole second of, generation of kids of Skylar, you know, Hugos. Sissies. Hugos, Hugos, nice. yeah, the Hugos of the business. Which and was a funny, um, like, took a minute to realize that that yeah. had even happened. Oh, really? And yeah, because yeah, no, like there was a funny moment because you know when you're sure. like in the traffic on That's it, right. you're just sort That's of. Right. Who's gonna play it and who's yeah. gonna do it? And it's maybe it'll be her and him, or maybe it'll be him and her. And then, right. and then there's a moment where it became clear what it was gonna be, and we're all just like, 
oh wait, and then there's me too, and <laughs> you know, yeah. like, and Stiller to a, a lesser degree. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Why don't we see yes, if Sophia exactly. Coppola wants to walk in the background? <laughs> wants to be the bank teller. <laughs> um, we can't talk about Orange County and not talk about Harold Ramis. Oh yes. Yeah. Who I think is the most important man to uh, in uh, comedic movies ever. Yeah, <laughs> so. he's a yeah. hero around these parts. Well, he's certainly a hero of mine, and it was uh, he was just amazing, brilliant guy. I said, sorry in every conceivable way to have lost him, and he was just the best. And I was fortunate to do it with him twice. Um, he came and did a completely insane thing and walk hard um, as one of the Hasidic Jewish record executives. <laughs> and um, he uh, and did a scene with John Riley in Yiddish. Um, he, uh, he was, did you ever, did you work with him? No, didn't have the pleasure, but just admired. Uh, one of the, Sweetest people, yeah. um, one of the sort of most, uh, you know, like, you know, what the quality is of just uh, total apparent wisdom, you know, um, this big, voracious mind, and, you know, uh, lit up every room, truly. And, uh, uh, you well, know, one of a kind. Wonderful, wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, funny as anyone's ever been yeah. and arguably the greatest comedy writer of all time there it needed to be said and it can't be said enough quite frankly because we certainly feel that way and we yeah. and whether it was Lorraine Newman or other people saying um, I think Catherine O'Hara said it too at one point in the early days um, Second City the beginnings of Saturday Night Live the beginnings yeah. of all that stuff uh, the sketch work that was being done live, everyone was looking to Harold for approval, and, mm -hmm. and um, they all say that. Yeah, you know that he was, and it, you 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 get it immediately though, because yeah. he was, uh, you know, did not have the sort of um, any of the uh, what's the word? The insecurity, the um, or the gravitas the, of "Hey, the, look at me." Yeah, that most artists suffer from. Or, or the um, you know need for approval that right. a lot of uh, the comedy live comedy performers, yeah. uh, you know, all of that um, desperate need for love. Yeah, that you know a lot of what your movie's about. That's uh, you know part of what um, fuels the the greats. You know, it just happened that. Um, Harold was not encumbered by yeah. those hang-ups or whatever, insecurities in a way that, or if he was, it was not apparent and you could always um, sense that he was the sort of still center beating heart at the, uh, you know, in the middle of that thing. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that wave of the, you know, I mean, those are the funniest people ever, some of those, uh, that, Probably the funniest group of people ever assembled in one, yeah. you know, company, that SCTV group. Yeah. And he was uh, leader of the pack. Leader of the pack. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. The, the, that's also part of this process is, is sometimes um, a paying respects in, in, in a way of, of certain talents that we get an opportunity to work with that, um, you know, it's... It, it almost seems, well, everyone knows. No, no, let's get into the specifics yeah. of, of your own personal experience. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, was a, that was a lucky one, too. I mean, that's definitely a thing where, like, I, I called him up and asked him to do that in uh, Orange County. I, I had known his daughter as a kid mm. um, and knew Harold barely. Um, you know, he was always around, and there were common people, but I didn't really know him, and he was just, you know, I was just a huge, huge fan. Because I always thought he was, like, just, I mean, like, his performances in, just as an actor, his performances in Stripes and Ghostbusters, I think, are, to my sense of humor, like, two of the funniest screen performances ever. <laughs> it's, like, the driest, right. uh, it's just the driest thing you could hope for, and it's just a, a um, it's like the, impossible standard of dry comedy acting, you right. know? And um, 
so you know, I was just reaching out that way. So I think this is one of the funniest guys in the world. And then it turned out that he was just this, uh, you know, ended up just being this kind of great presence and this great learning experience. And you know, somebody you could talk to about anything and talk to about the work and talk to about the world and just truly interesting guy. Right. Yeah. Um, so you step into the world of TV again with the pilot uh, directing of New Girl mm -hmm. and um, experience that which is Zoe. But first, Liz Merriweather, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, who came to you before Zoe was on board. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about that because that's yeah. um, thriving today. I. Uh, that was another phone call out of the blue that ends up determining a huge chunk of your life. Um, Liz and I had met a couple of times, I think, you know, but like very fleetingly socially. And um, I was, uh, I had liked this, uh, I was a fan of her script um, for the movie that became uh, No Strings Attached. Ivan um, Riven, another former guest. We're just going to yeah. discuss all the former guests. Exactly. <laughs> well, you've had Directed. a lot of amazing <laughs> well, list here. Uh, so you liked her script. You knew I her loved, socially. I knew her. I knew her. Barely I, I've been, We were acquainted. Yeah, I didn't really know her very well. And um, she was clearly a fan. I was. Of yours. I was a fan of her script. Uh, I. She. I guess so. I mean, she kind of like. You know, reached out through a common friend and said, "Please come direct this pilot." And I thought it was hilarious and just had a completely sort of distinctive voice. And it's just that rare thing with the pilot script where you're actually laughing on the second page. Um, I right. just uh, can count the number of times that's been the case. And that's before you have the talent. Yeah, this was attached. just the script. That's just on. This was just the script. And. Um, uh, I was actually in New York uh, overseeing uh, the uh, Friends with Kids experience, and she reached out. And um, I mean, it was the funny, our joke about it now is, you know, she wrote me this hilarious, great email asking me to do it. And um, at the end of it said, you know, it's seven days in March um, if, you, if I can get you to come do this. And it's like four years later, I've talked to her almost every day for four years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just this, um, we've just finished the 85th episode of the show or something. Uh, you know, it just Seven became, days a month. Uh, yeah, and it just became like the, it was, it's been the, the basis of this next, you know, few years of my career, really. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, it leads to uh, a deal on the lot there at Fox and developing of other Some things. Other shows, and, yeah. And, and, and the development and directing of other shows. And, yeah. And, and, and yeah. It and is. continuing to work on that show. I work on, I think about New Girl a little bit every day. Yeah. Like I'm always working on it, you know. Which, for a, um, a gun for hire, technically, uh, who has remained proactive mm -hmm. from the get uh, and clearly believes in. A similar mantra to here, which is if you're not creating, you're waiting. Right. It, it is strange at times to find yourself with a steady gig. Yeah. It's but been it's interesting. First time in my life, you yeah. know. Um, a bit exhilarating. And having just turned 40, October 30th, October 28th. Ah, there you go. I'm way past the 40, but yeah. a similar date. Yeah. Um, how is that, the turning of the 40, in the place of having this uh, <laughs> regular gig and and developing other things. Yeah, it's funny. You've uh, uh, you've, you've definitely zeroed in on that. It was um, uh, fine, you know. <laughs> I mean, it like it's, it sounds weird to say it. Is my right. biggest thing with forty. Is it just? It's sounds... a number that's more important in, in theory. Yeah, it, it it feels pretty similar, but it sounds a lot older. Yeah, yeah. 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 You feel pretty much. Forty is the you new. You can say it, Sam. Forty is the new thirty-eight. Uh, yeah, I've heard some stuff like that, but it still just kind of sounds like 40 when you yeah. say it. Um, well, sure. The, uh, <laughs> you, sound, you feel uh, pretty much the same as you did three or four or six months prior yeah. to the number changing. Yeah, uh, very much the same. Yeah. Um, you know, the, in terms of the having a... Uh, I've had this interesting thing, and particularly this year, where it's like where New Girl is in its fourth season, um, and... Uh, is still like fun and engaging and interesting and you know I don't direct the show so much this year but I am um, 
you know, I'm in there working on it with them and we're producing yeah. Point of View all the time. And then there, I've, um, you know, we, we've got two new mid-season shows that I've been working on. And um, one of which I direct the pilot for, the other of which I, I didn't, but I, uh, you know, one of the producers and directed the next one. And so I've got all of this television stuff happening um, this fall, and it's been really kind of fun and interesting, new thing. I've never had three things happening simultaneously ever. I mean, usually it's been one very focused thing that I'm doing at a time, and it does seem a little more like um, having a job than I've ever yeah. had, and it's been kind of fun. Are great. one of those two the Will Forte thing? No. No. Oh. Um, that I, is I a different mid-season show at Fox. Right. Um, this is uh, the one uh, I'm doing one at Fox called Weird Loners that um, was created by Michael Whitehorn, who's a terrific writer, um, most uh, famously the guy who created King of Queens, mm -hmm. and um, and he's great. And we have a really good group of people. We just finished making six of those, and then. Also, a show called Fresh Off the Boat that's a mid-season show for ABC, um, created by Nanachka Khan, who created uh, The Bitch in Apartment 23. Mm -hmm. And that is a family sitcom about the only Chinese-American family in Orlando in their neighborhood in the 90s. And um, it's a really cool... Is it multi-camera? No, no, it's a... It's all a, single camera. All single hey, camera. You haven't done yeah. the multi-camera yet? No, I've never done it. I wouldn't know how. From lack of desire. And it, it seems like it's more, much more of a writer's medium than the single camera. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, I truly wouldn't know how to do it. I was at a taping for one uh, a few months ago yeah. for the first time in a about beast. 30 years. And I w was standing on the floor watching them rehearse and do it and everything. And I really thought, like, this is just a completely different thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. in every way, shape, For a director, form. for sure. Yeah. Um, you uh, have done an outstanding job. We're, we don't plan on keeping you much longer uh, as, as, <laughs> as, as torturous as this has been. I got nowhere to be. <laughs> <laughs> How old are the kids at home now? Uh, they are, they, I have two two-year-olds and a four-year-old. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, boy. So it's weird that you're not it's anxious to rush kids. back. <laughs> <laughs> so what else you got? Does anyone we're else gonna, have any questions about what kind of smoothies <laughs> I like? <or>? <laughs> <laughs> We were going to go to Santa Anita <laughs> Racetrack. We thought maybe you might want to come along. Um, no, I, I, do, I do very much want to uh, thank you for, uh, yeah. for honestly coming and sharing. And, um, and, and, uh, I've loved it. Yeah, we, we, uh, we've been fans for, for a while, and Sam had mentioned a few times uh, what, how fun it would be, and, and then uh. it was just a matter of, of uh, let the begging begin, and then... Um, Hope he, uh, I hope I proved him right. Uh, the, uh, oh, certainly. It's a, a total pleasure to come and talk to you guys. Really, yeah, no, really we, we, thank you. We really love having um, filmmakers on, quite frankly, because it, it, is, um, it is an amazing uh, singular profession where, sure, it's done a, a variety of different ways, but in terms of that striving to wanting to be in charge of the storytelling mm -hmm. and then how how massively impossible of a task it is on paper yeah. when you actually sit back and, and break it all down to to the varying degrees of be it casting and be it finding a cinematographer who says mm -hmm. what you know that that particular aspect isn't one that I that I've heard before and I'm I'm grateful for it you know in terms of sharing that and you know it's um it's not as it's doable. People do it all the time. Right. And it's if just, I may, it's, you should it, write a book on directing it, and title it. it yeah, it's, it's doable. doable. And I mean, I, I do think there's a little bit of a conspiracy of um, mystique. Uh, well, as Ed Wood proved, yeah. it's certainly doable. Yeah. And then, as other very few have proved, <laughs> it yeah, it's difficult to do, do well. well. And then what you see... Like there's a great William you, Shatner impression. Right, yeah. And then there's, and then there's an then imitation there's the of a great William Shatner hired. impression. <laughs> yeah. And there's also... There's one exactly... <laughs> Gonna have to launch a career. Come on! Uh, the, um, you know, there's... Um, you'll... The, 
if you really look at it and look at the people you most admire and the, your favorite directors, by and large, you like half of their movies or three quarters of their movies. And so what it tells Absolutely. you is that even the great people, it's hard for them to keep it, to be consistent, to keep it going. It's not hard, it's impossible. A, yeah. It's actually not doable. So, yeah, and I think that almost like if you are respectful of that reality, historical if you know fact. that, that historical fact, you know. And, um, and also the, it is the doing of it. You know, one of the things that uh, Judd Ap Apatow talked about in the documentary was I thought when the f film came out and it was successful, I yeah. would find happiness. Yeah. I didn't. I thought, now I believe the doing of it is yeah. the happiness. Yes. Um, now I'm trying to figure out how to be happy doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> how to find that same yeah. <laughs> level of con contentment. Uh -huh. um, it is the doing of it. For sure. And so then the, the end result being uh, wildly uh, received um, and having a life um, that part of it seems like uh, it, it's going to happen on some of them, and it's definitely not going to happen. Yeah, on and you them. just have no control over no. it. No, so it is the doing of it. It is. Yeah. It is uh, the doable part. Yeah, as you and uh, yeah, that's right. It's the um, did you have a good time? Did you behave in a way that you can be proud of afterwards? Uh, which I think is really important and an undervalued element of the conversation. Good for you, and thanks for saying that. Um, 100%. You, I have no uh, tolerance or threshold for... Uh, Antics. Yeah, no assholes policy. And, um, you know, it's just a... Uh, which is part of, did you have a good time? It's also part of, you know, can you do your good work? How are you going to do your best work? For me, that's very clearly... Um, I'm just better in every, at every aspect of it. I make better decisions, I have better ideas, I have funnier instincts about things if I'm relaxed and having fun. There's a lot of elements that can make you less relaxed. There's always a clock, there's always um, yeah. a lot of stuff to coordinate, all of that can sort of stress you out. To whatever extent you can kind of keep that modulated and remember what an incredible thing it is to be doing it in the first place. Right. It's, for me, very freeing. And the truth is that the doing is all of it. And even the, the creative work of doing, you know, apart from the experiential, just the, the getting there with somebody, loving what an actor is doing, loving the rush of uh, getting a sequence executed properly as you're shooting it and then as you're cutting it and all of that uh, are the only real kind of that's the only thing you can take with you because the other part of it, you just never have any idea. No. And I've never been right about it once. The ones that I've thought were going to work haven't mostly. The ones that I thought I was kind of taking a flyer and like, oh, this will be fun for 12 people have had much bigger lives than that, you know. Um, right. You just never have any idea what it's going to be. So you do a bunch of stuff and try to... Don't forget to have worry fun. about it that much. Yeah, have a good time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. As have we here today. Well, you, there's only so one. Much. There's only one task left. Oh no! It is a ritual that occurs at the end of the show. We call it the Larry King game. Uh, you've had actors on your sets improvising. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be terrible at this. I you can know tell. what? Here's the good news. <laughs> if you are, uh, if you if if this if that should yeah. be your manifest destiny. Uh huh. Yeah. Then um, there's you've succeeded. Yeah. Because there's actually no way to do this incorrectly. Uh, so here's the rule. I can find a way. Give me the rules. Yeah. Then. So if you ever watch Larry King, he, he would do a thing where he would uh, go to the phones, of course. But right before mm -hmm. going to the phone, sometimes he'd look down the barrel of the camera and he felt the need to share something about himself or, or a particular favorite thing of his. I love Oreo cookies, something really banal. <laughs> and then go, but I mean, it was always something that he shared that no one cared about. That's, that's the moment we're looking for you to create. The Larry King game is, consists of a bad Larry King impression. We'd like to remove all the pressure of doing a good Larry King impression. Okay. There's no pressure here. Yeah, this what is makes, a total train wreck. Yeah, yeah. what <laughs> makes me laugh is a bad Larry King impression. Uh -huh. It's preferred. Uh -huh. So you can't fail sure. there. Okay. And then look into your camera when you're ready and share, as Larry, 
share something about Larry that no one needs to know, and then go to the phones. That's it. And the name of the city is funny sounding that you go to that might not hurt. So it's bad Larry King impressions. Share something about Larry that no one needs to know, and then go to the phones. That's all. When you're ready, so please, please. Can you give me one example? Not to over, you I'm want sure a prototype? for your audience. Yeah, give me the prototype of... Sam, you want to do the impression of me doing the prototype? Do you, do you have it by now? <laughs> <laughs> do you have it by now? Instead of me just doing it again? Thanksgiving, before the guests arrive, I like to teabag the gravy boats. <laughs> Poughkeepsie, go. <laughs> That's it. And he, what would be that? Just give you have one example of the actual thing. <laughs> <laughs> like what would it? What does it sound like when he's doing? Oh, he, he literally I mean, would say, "I when can't he's not get enough bagging the yeah, gravy." Yeah, I would literally look at the camera and say, "I can't get enough Oreo cookies." That's just my kind of cookie. <laughs> what? Why? Why? Why do we need to know that, Larry? <laughs> That's where it all kind of came from. That he was just sharing something banal and uninteresting, or his first ride on a pterodactyl. You know, because he's, <laughs> he's very old. It's any of those things. You're just sharing something about Larry in a bad Larry King impression, and then go to the phone. If I may, That's just, it. just to Please. help our guest ever so slightly. Sure. Please. Keep again, as Kevin mentioned, he's very old. I bet he used to hang out with a lot of old Hollywood. Mm. I'm just saying. Maybe he did. Was there a time that he? There he might recalled? have been a time he was hanging out with. Uh, Fill in the blank. You know, Marlene and Dietrich. Fill in the blank. What have you? Whoever. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, this is just a car accident. No, 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 no. You're going to be fine. <laughs> there's no way to fail here. There's no way to fail. There's no way to fail. No. There's your camera uh, when you're ready. Stare down the barrel. Don't be afraid. Yeah, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, that's part of the fun. <laughs> uh, uh, when, uh, when, uh, He's like, I'm who, looking to Levine for help. This who is did, what maybe he, uh, uh, a young Judy Garland was his babysitter. There you go. Uh-huh. <laughs> maybe there was something inappropriate so like, there. Like, yes. Does it start with, it doesn't start with anything. It's just, it's however it comes to Larry. Uh, Excuse me. As you can see, could not be more ill-equipped for the. Uh, a young Judy Garland. Which is, I'm not taking that want. seriously. I'll, I'll give you anything you want. Uh, uh, he. Uh, I, I don't know where do we go. Where? Yeah, uh, the, um, uh, you literally can't fail. Yeah. If so you just literally looked like, down the barrel and said. This morning I had, and then whatever you ate for breakfast, and then go to Poughkeepsie. I mean, that's literally uh -huh. what we're looking for. I got it. Okay. <laughs> and you're thinking, what's the greatest joke that I could possibly yeah, write no, in a and, second? And at this no, moment, I'm just bailing on that's that not completely. It. That's yeah. not it. So it's literally we're looking like, for maybe, the lame. Maybe Larry's talking about what his favorite smoothie is. Yeah. There we go. Boom. Love what a mango it? smoothie. Hello, Traverse City. <laughs> and there like it is. There you go. <laughs> Here's the good news. You got through it. <laughs> uh, total success. I asked yeah, for lame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I really, and I delivered. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you get with the Larry King uh, game. Exactly. Fantastic. Otherwise. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good. Honestly Love and it. truly. Uh, sit there uncomfortably, me. please, for, for uh, 54 seconds while I wrap things up. Absolutely. All right. That is your Jake Kasdan, ladies and Jews. Um, <laughs> We're going to take off a few weeks for the holidays. Enjoy yourself some Thanksgiving. Don't forget, uh, on the back of the genocide of the Native Americans, I'll be enjoying some turkey. <laughs> uh, Sammy? Hey, buddy. Thanks for everything. Hey, my pleasure. Jamie, <laughs> as always, thank you. No, I thought you were going to tell me to get out of your face. No, I'm going to be like, no problem. I thank you for, uh, for the Herald question. That was a winner. We thank yeah. uh, Josh and J-Mac up in the crow's nest. Kenny here on the floor, our own... Megan, look at Megan. Uh, we had Sam, uh, Samantha Ward last, uh, last week, but um, Megan was kind enough to fill in uh, as she did a, a couple of weeks ago, and we appreciate that very much. Danielle Overland, the media maven, who we want to thank from the bottom of our hearts, helping out uh, with, the, uh, with the social networking uh, for quite some time on the show now. Um, and uh, who am I leaving? Oh, the fine folks at the Westside Comedy Theater, Tim Jennison for the TriCaster, the wonderful folks at New Tech. I believe that's it. I always... Can I thank my parents? They're watching. Please. They wanted me to send their best to Jake. So. Ah, send my love. There you go. Will do. Are they Will thanking do. him for a career? For every day. <laughs> <laughs> every day. Uh, hardly. Uh, and there you have it. Uh, until next time, uh, Joel Murray, I believe, is uh, scheduled for December 7th. Oh. That might be our very next show. Until then, and as always... Get out of my face.